Thank you very much for that lovely introduction and for the lovely setting and for the lovely company and the wonderful evening last night at the Sistine Chapel. It was, it was all uh, really extraordinary and memorable. Um, let me start out my talk by saying this. We avoid tragedy by thinking tragically. Uh, and uh, much of what I say is going to seem negative, but it's really about the fact that we live in a world where there is more and more uncertainty. It's not necessarily headed for disaster. It just means it's a more complex, anxious, fraught world uh, than ever before, where globalization and geopolitics, rather than be in contradiction, actually reinforce each other. Um, because now every place is interrelated to every other place as never before. So that, um, so, so that you have geopolitics, the battle of space and power, operating, um, it, uh, operating at, a, at a more complex rate uh, than ever before. Now, let me start this way. 22 years ago, I published a cover story essay in the Atlantic Monthly called The Coming Anarchy. And that laid out a, an argument that resource scarcity, environmental security, change, sectarianism, tribalism, the rise of demographic male youth bulges um, in the Middle East and Africa, uh, and so on, and, and the interrelationship increasingly of war and crime would lead, uh, would lead to uh, the politi more political fraying and fracturing of the planet. So that, um, so that states at risk would either weaken further or they would collapse. And I named a number of West African states, all of which collapsed within the five years after the article was published. And the article was too negative, frankly, because a lot of good things have happened in the world as well. Uh, what I'd like to do is sort of update that article over the next 30 minutes. Um, and what is it that we're seeing when we see collapses in Libya, Yemen, Iraq, uh, Iraq, Syria, crises in Europe, in, in, in Asia, the South China Sea? What's really going on here? If we take a few steps back from the media and look at it, I, I would believe that we live in what I call a post-imperial moment uh, and an age of comparative anarchy. That just means more anarchy than we've been used to in the Cold War and the post-Cold War. It does not mean total anarchy. Let me get into specifics about all this. The post-imperial moment. We've been brought up in schools and colleges to believe that imperialism is evil, that it's, the, that it's the original sin that the West inflicted on what was called the, the developing world. In fact, as Oxford scholar John Darwin writes in a path-breaking book after Tamerlane, empire has been the default mode of human political organization since the dawn of history. Uh, and Empire merely means government, a government from a central so source over a vast land area composed of different ethnic and religious and, uh, and other groups. Um, before, uh, before the European empires, you had a number of empires in Africa, the Sung, the Mali, etc. You had Indian and Chinese empires going back thousands of years. The same with Persian empires. And essentially, as Darwin lays out, the Cold War was imperialism by another name, whereby the Soviet Union and the United States were not officially uh, empires, but, they op but in a functional sense, their challenges and frustrations were much like that of empires in the past. Now, at the end of World War I, the Habsburg and Ottoman empires collapsed in Europe. And again, the Habsburg and Ottoman empires protected minority rights and provided for a degree of civility that did not exist in the uni-ethnic states that would replace them between the two wars. So you had the collapse of those two empires after World War I. After World War II, you had the start of the collapse, which would take about 15 years, 20 years afterwards, 
of the British and French empires throughout Africa and, and Eurasia. And then in 1991, you got the collapse of the Soviet empire. And since, um, and, and since the last decade, you see the weakening or, or at least a more, uh, you know, a, a, a more deliberate, cautious attitude on the part of the only great power left standing that operates on an imperial dimension, shall we say, the United States of America. Now, when the British and French empires collapsed in the Middle East and elsewhere, you did not have the breakdown of states. What happened? You had what I call post-imperial strongmen. People like Muammar Gaddafi, the Assad family, Saddam Hussein, Ali Abdullah Saleh in Yemen, and, and others. And they operated according to the borders artificially created by empires. And then because those borders were averse to ethnic and sectarian borders, they had to erect secular state identities. Um, and because these were, in many cases, artificial states, they required an extreme form of totalitarian in totalitarianism in order to keep the state together in the first place, an extreme totalizing um, ideology, if you will. And so they maintained order at an extreme price for many decades. Then they they disappeared from the scene. Uh, Gaddafi was toppled internally. Uh, the, Assad, uh, the Assad family in Syria has been weakened immeasurably. And in, and in Iraq, it was the United States military that toppled Saddam Hussein. And the result of that was an utter void, sheer chaos. Why is that? Why is that? Because they left no institutions in their wake. Between the ruler at the top and the tribe and extended family at the bottom, there was nothing. No intermediary levels of social or political organization, uh, which might have allowed for some, for some stability. Because again, these, these rulers ruled in a totalizing form where there was nothing in between. And with weak institutions, there were weak state identities. Because loyalty to a state is based on services and order that a state provides. When that's no longer existent, there's no longer much loyalty to the state. And of course, religious, ethnic, cultural, sectarian uh, forms of identity fill fill the void in order to provide self-protection self for individuals. And then you had doctrinal, ba doctrinal battles. When Christianity dominated the Mediterranean basin at the, in late antiquity, P you might think that would lead to peace on earth. It didn't. It led to the same level of violence, even greater level of violence, than the Roman Empire, because there were battles between sects and heresies and others as to what form of Christianity was proper. The same thing in the Muslim world today, where you have battles between sex and others as to what form of Islam um, is, you know, is proper. So that's basically why the Middle East is the way it is today. Now, dividing up the Middle East further, before I go on to other areas of the world, you have what I call age-old clusters of civilization. Greater Carthage, Tunisia, Morocco, the Nile Valley, Egypt, which did have very well-developed state identities and loyalties to states that transcended loyalty to religion or to sect. And this was because the state was not artificial. It had been an age-old cluster of civilization going back to antiquity. But places like Libya, Syria, Iraq were really vague geographical expressions. Sure, they had been great civilizations in history, but not, <clears throat> not organized in, within the same borders or the same coherency as Tunisia, Egypt, and Morocco, and others. And that's why at root, uh, age-old clusters of civilization like Morocco, Tunisia, and Egypt required much more moderate forms of tyranny than the kind you found in Algeria, in Libya, in Iraq, and Iran. Because they were artificial, they had to be governed in a more extreme manner just in order to hold it together. And then we have 
um, the United States, which during the Cold War and for a decade or two afterwards was able to project power very efficiently by working through dictators. One phone number, one fax machine, one email address, et cetera, to deal with crises. Court diplomacy still operated. <clears throat> You, you know, there was a crisis in, in, in Egypt. You dealt with Hosni Mubarak or Anwar Sadat or whoever it was. Crisis in, in Tunisia, uh, Habib Bourguiba or Zine El Abdin Ben Ali or whoever it was. But with the breakdown of dictatorships counterintuitively, it, ma it made it harder for the United States to project power throughout the Middle East because even though these places became nominally more democratic for a time, it meant that there were dozens upon dozens of actors whose points of view had to be taken into account, whereas before there had just been one, and it made diplomacy and power projection similar. So that the United States finds itself limited in a more complex world where, it, where, Ameri where American influence is just not what it used to be. And we'll get back to that a little bit later. Um, now, in the Middle East today, before moving on to other areas, what do I see? I see the places that are the most coherent in terms of geography and in terms of history are the non-Arab great powers of Turkey and Iran. Turkey is synonymous with the Anatolian land bridge, Iran with the Iranian plateau. The Iranian plateau has hosted Persian language empires going back thousands of years. And, and Iran has a, has a deep civilizational sense of itself to the same extent as India or China, and therefore <clears throat> is in a different category than the many artificial Arab states. So that um, Iran, and, Iran and Turkey may be politically troubled. Iran may go on as a, as a very you know, extreme, dysfunctional, to some extent, grievance-driven regime that does not moderate, that does not reform, but still is basically coherent and stable uh, um, and exists. I say this because um, when you have a regime that has multiple centers of power, and not just two, but at least four different political persuasions or factions, political scientists tell us that this leads to more of the same rather than to an upheaval. It's a stability, though, of a very calcifying sort. Um, I like to say that Iran is permanently stuck in the Brezhnev phase of its revolution. Um, Turkey also will go through domestic unrest changes, but it will always exist as a state. It's, and the same with Egypt, by the way. Um, it's, it's harder to say that about their Middle Eastern neighbors. Um, Saudi Arabia is no longer the global swing producer for hydrocarbons the way, to the degree that it used to be now with the shale gas revolution in the United States and, and other factors. Saudi Arabia does not cohere with the Arabian Peninsula nearly to the extent that Turkey coheres with the Anatolian land bridge or Iran with the Iranian plateau. So it's an artificial state going back much shorter in time than Turkey or Iran. And Turkey and Iran have real imperial traditions which still function psychologically, be it Ottoman and Turkey's case or whether it's uh, you know the various um, uh, the various um, empires in Iran, Achaemenid, Safavid, and others, um, so that um, the real the, the the real question going forward in the Middle East is what regime will last the longest and be, and prosper the most, the one in Tehran or the one in Riyadh. Because we've seen the collapses of a number of Middle Eastern states, but it hasn't really affected global financial markets or other f global business to, to, a, to a profound extent that really leads to upheaval. Those collapses have been factored in, so to speak. But were the regime in Saudi Arabia to undergo real upheaval, 
or really stagnate, that could change things. I'm not predicting Saudi Arabia's collapse. I think the House of Saud has been altogether brilliant in the last 35 years in many ways, of, you know, of, of ruling a society that's gone from a primitive level to a postmodern level while still maintaining rule through, through a family of about 1,500 people who, because they're so large, are basically their own in, inbred intelligence agency with links to all the different factions in the kingdom. Going on to Asia. Asia is the inverse of everything I just said. Um, what I've been talking about for the last 10 minutes has been the, uh, the weakening of states, the weakening of artificial states. In Asia, the, uh, the geopolitical uncertainties in the South and East China seas have mainly been due to the strengthening of states. Um, China, look at the Cold War, the second half of the Cold War, and the period for, uh, you know, immediately afterwards. What did we have? We had China internally focused. First with Mao Zedong's de uh, depredations, the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution. Then with uh, Deng Xiaoping's um, economic modernization and development, the, uh, the, you know, the new economic mechanism. One bad, one thing good, but both internally focused. You had Japan in a state of quasi-pacifism due to its disastrous experience with World War II militarism. You had Vietnam and what is called now Malaysia internally focused with civil wars and communist insurgencies. Singapore in the 1960s was a very weak, fragile new state that many people did not think would last very long. Um, <coughs> The Philippines had a communist insurgency, and, and so it goes. Taiwan was just under an enlightened dictatorship of Chiang Kai-shek, you know, which would evolve, for, which would institutionalize further only in the future. But now look where we are. All these states have strongly institutionalized um, and have been, you know, and, and are in a much more coherent state. Um, China shows the lesson that pseudo-capitalist or capitalist success over many decades steady leads to a number of things, but it also leads to military acquisition and, moder and modern modernization. Because pseudo-capitalistic or capitalistic success over that long a period, a third of a century, leads to trading relationships throughout the world, leads to interests throughout the world that have to be defended, then issues of status come into it, and with issues of status, a nation quite naturally wants to develop a great military. This is not that different from the pattern that happened in the United States between the end of the Civil War and the outbreak of the Spanish-American War in 1898 when the United States announced itself as an imperial-like great power. And with China's military expanding, Japan has slipped out of its quasi-pacifistic mode to you know, to discover militarism, uh, not militarism, excuse me, uh, to develop, a, a, you know, normal nationalism as a default option. Vietnam and Malaysia are now, uh, are now at peace. They've been at peace for decades. They're, much, you know, they're, they're internally secure. So what do they do? They build navies and air forces, uh, you know, in order to counter the Chinese military growth. And has and, and Singapore has become this Israel-like military dynamo in the center of the south, at the south, south, southern extreme of the South China Sea. So that you have all these states now coherent, more strongly institutionalized, and now what are they doing? They're projecting power outwards rather than being internally focused. And that leads naturally to disputes over who controls what piece of the of the resource-rich South China Sea, or who controls what islands in the, in the East China Sea. So this is, a, this is almost a natural development of success, almost, uh, uh, you know, a, a, of modern development, these conflicts we see that are, um, and it, it, that, that we see in Asia. And to show you how, just to give you small example of how technology has not negated geography. Think of India and China for a moment. 
India and China, for most of their history, had very little to do with each other. Two great civilizations developing separately, separated by the high wall of the Himalayas. Yes, Buddhism spread from India to China, and the Opium Wars brought them both into a system of, uh, y uh, y you know, I I into a system of, compl of conflict. Um, but for most of history, India and China were really un unrelated to each other. But look nowadays. You have Indian ballistic missiles that can reach every, most Chinese cities. You have Chinese fighter jets based in Tibet that can reach the Indian subcontinent. You have Indian warships in the South China Sea. You have Chinese warships throughout the Indian Ocean. So that the defeat of distance by modern technology has created a new geography of rivalry between India and China and brought them together in a way that never existed before. And this is how technology, globalization, complexified geography uh, and, uh, rather than defeating it, so to speak. They make geography more claustrophobic. That's the word I'm looking for. That's the world today where geography is more, it hasn't disappeared, it's just far, far more claustrophobic. All right, then we have Europe. Um, it was a great French geographer in the middle of the 20th century, Fernand Braudel, who wrote that Europe's southern border is not the Mediterranean. It's not Italy and Spain and Greece. It's the Sahara Desert because that's where the climatic system that defines Europe essentially ends. And that the, the, the coast of North Africa was historically as much part of Europe as Italy or Spain, and it was only an artificial interregnum that had separated the two, so to speak. Well, artificial, it lasted from late antiquity to modern times with the you know, Islamic invasion of North Africa in the 7th, 8th century. But nevertheless, what we see now with migrant traffic, migrants, refugees, coming from North Africa, coming from the Levant into Europe, you see that Europe is di dissolving somewhat into, into greater Eurasia, into, into North Africa, and the Mediterranean basin can be thought of as one unit in the way that it wasn't. Remember that one of the many reasons that Europe was more or less peaceful, um, secure, more and more prosperous during the Cold War years and the decade or so following was that Europe was functionally separated from the problems of Soviet Russia and from North Africa. It was separated from North Africa and the Middle East by these totalitarian police states I mentioned. It was separated from Soviet Russia because the United States did so much to carry the defense burden, and even after the Soviet Union collapsed, Russia was in a state of internal disarray for a decade or more, and you know, which, which also made it less of a problem for Europe. Those days are over, and Europe now faces an integration of sorts in terms of, a, in terms of, in terms of human traffic, a conflict system, uh, with the rest of Eurasia, with Africa to an extent it hasn't before. And also, if you look at the population growth rates of Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, and those of Europe, you see that the refugees may just be the tip of the iceberg in terms of um, pressure from migrants that are gonna come over the next few decades. Because even though world population growth is declining. It's declining at a slower rate in sub-Saharan Africa than it is elsewhere, and is therefore rising at a much higher rate than Europe. And of course, I don't need to tell you that with the different reactions to the refugees, we have pressure on the Schengen, the Schengen border area. So divisions are coming up through Europe from within. Um, rather than see the collapse of the EU or some catastrophic scenario, I think one of the best analyses that I've read about what's starting to transpire in Europe was written by a scholar at St. Anthony's College in Oxford of Polish descent, Jan Zelenka. Um, and he basically laid out an argument that what we're going to see is a kind of, in a positive sense, a new medievalism in Europe, where we, the EU will still exist, it will still function, but it won't be a unified, one-dimensional super state from Iberia to the Black Sea. 
and we'll see a weaker EU, we'll see the growth and the de more definition of city states and of region states all acting together so that the political picture of Europe in terms of people's multiple identities will be more complex and multi-layered, but Europe can still function and it will be very it'll be a very unwieldy and gradual transition. Um, and, and the book is called Is the EU Doomed? And essentially he answers no, it's not. Um, and, but again, like in Europe, like the Middle East, like Asia, we're seeing more uncertainty, more change. And then finally, let me just say a word on, on, on China and Russia. Uh, I think that there's a debate going on about how deep the economic crisis in China will go. You have real pessimists who see a collapse. You have optimists who say, no, they can get through. Let me just, sh let me just telescope it into this question. For the last 35 years, we've had essentially non-charismatic, collegial, risk-averse technocrats running China. Um, uh, and because of that, um, Chinese foreign policy towards China, from the United States at least, has been fairly bipartisan without the battles, the ideological battles you see in Washington over the Middle East or some other areas of the world. In other words, China was predictable, uh, run by enlightened, dull, enlightened authoritarians. Is good a, as good a situation as you could, as you could practically get. Uh, you know, given the diversity, the unwieldiness of China, which extends from the coast of the Pacific deep into East Turkestan, part of Central Asia. And because China is also, to a lesser extent than the Soviet Union, a prison of nations, with ethnic Uyghur, Turkic Muslims, with inner Mongolians, with Tibetans, uh, who are, uh, who can become very, who might become more and more restive if we see a deepening economic crisis. I would say that the next 30 years in China are not going to be as easy for the West as the, as the last 30 years. And we're already starting to see it. You're starting to see a more charismatic central leader emphasizing more central control, a cult of personality building around him. Uh, in, in order to face off against the domestic challenges. Uh, the um, the anti-corruption drive is that, but it's also a great purge of, of the leader's enemies, uh, or what he thinks may be his opponents. So the domestic situation in China is going to become more fraught, and that could lead to a more aggressive Chinese foreign policy in the South and East China Sea. Because one of the ways you deal with domestic disarray of sorts is, with, is, by, is, by, you know, is by an appeal to nationalism. Um, Russia, too. I think the one thing more dangerous than Russian strength, um, Russian military strength, is Russian internal weakness. Um, uh, I, the, the, the economic situation in Russia is much more uh, severe than the one in China. Russia is a more weakly institutionalized state than China is. Um, what I really see in Putin is still the legacy of 70 years of communism, of, of the Soviet Union, uh, you know, with a narrow group of elite run in somewhat Politburo style. Uh, with oligarchs instead of ideal, you, you know, instead of instead of you know various communist chieftains on top, and with very weak institutions below the level of leadership, um, a, a somewhat chaotic, criminalized uh, version of capitalism, and as the economic crisis deepens in Russia. Um, I, Russia will not collapse, but we could see a more, a, a more weakened state that can become more aggressive um, externally, and with all that that entails for the Baltic area, for Ukraine, for the Black Sea region, um, um, et cetera. That's why I say 
we live in an age of compa comparative anarchy, meaning more risk, more uncertainty, than in what were essentially pre more predictive ages like the Cold War and the, and the immediate post-Cold War. And just to give you a, a snapshot sense of this, if you were a country in Eastern Europe or East Central Europe, in 1995, it seemed like you were escaping from history. You were going to get into NATO. You were going to get into the EU. NATO had no problems. What could be more problem-free and prosperous and wonderful than the European Union? And Russia was conveniently weak and chaotic under Boris Yeltsin. Now all that has been reversed. Um, uh, NATO is more uncertain. The EU has tremendous problem, structural and institutional problems, and Russia is no longer weak and chaotic and is, and is a threat again. Uh, so it's almost as if history, you, there uh, you, you didn't leave history to begin with. You just had like a 15, 20 year hiatus. And th let me just conclude with a word or two on the United States. Um, the United States um, is go you know, has had unimpressive economic growth the last eight years or so. It's, it's, it's uh, technically close to full employment statistically, but most of the jobs created, or many of them, have been low-paying, part-time service jobs. Last year, I spent six weeks driving across the United States, just listening to people's conversations, to the things they, observing them, and what I discovered visually was something that the economists tell us actually exists, which is that the middle middle class is disappearing, a smaller amount are, are rising upward into the, into the global, you know, Chardonnay sipping upper middle. Even in places like Kansas, Nebraska, Wyoming, you see real high-end restaurants for the minority. Um, and then you see, um, a, a, but a much larger percentage is slipping into a lower middle, you know, you know uh, just one or two, uh, uh, you know, unforeseen incidents away from, tra from poverty and tragedy. And so is the middle class phrase in the middle middle, you really have a question about U.S. leadership. Because undergirding, the support for a 300-ship navy which guards the sea lines of communications, the choke points, you know, the numbered air forces, uh, you know, the large army that allowed for, large army and marine corps that allowed for various interventions, bad and good. Um, you had a quiescent middle class that essentially un underwrote this and said, don't give us any more 9-11s, but don't give us any more Iraq wars. And anything in the middle of those two extremes is OK, and we're not interested in it. Um, it was amazing, the lack of discussion of foreign policy in middle America. Even on the day that the Iran Accord was first initial, nobody cared or was talking about it. And because the middle middle is fraying, this really creates questions about US, U.S. leadership going forward in terms of the size of its Navy, Air Force. Um, different presidents have different, you know, different proclivities. You could may well get a new president in the United States that's much more activist in foreign affairs, much more uh, power projection oriented than President Obama has been. It also may be the case that President Obama's so-called hesitancy to project force is part of a, a sea change in American foreign policy that will transcend his administration, whatever may be said in the campaign um, by either candidate. So again, I'll leave you here with a lot of questions, not many answers. The world is not coming apart, but it is more and more fraught, anxious, uncertain, and claustrophobic than it's ever been.